Tress of the Emerald Sea. This book has been met with pretty positive reviews so far, I think. I enjoyed it a lot, but this video is going to be about Tress herself. Tress the person. There will be major spoilers for Tress of the Emerald Sea, the book, so if you haven't read it or listened to it yet, I suggest you save this video until you have. Otherwise, let's get into it. Tress is kind of the cliche girl who's not like all the other girls, but I kind of like the spin that's put on it is that all the other girls say, I'm not like everybody else, I'm unique. And since they all say that, and Tress doesn't say that about herself, she's the one who stands out and is actually different. <laughs> Personally, I do find Tress to be super relatable. She is definitely one of my new favorite characters now. She's kind of a quiet, introspective person. She does not like to impose upon people. She does not like to ask for things for herself, especially if it causes any trouble for the person she's asking. And I love that she collects cups because it's not actually about the cups. She and her family are basically trapped on this little island. There's laws against leaving. No one is allowed to leave. So she knows she's probably going to spend her days there. She can sit and she can watch the sea. She can watch the ships come and go, but she never imagines herself on one. But sometimes sailors coming into port bring her a cup and those cups to her represent all those far off places that she may never get to see. Not may never, she expects to never see far off places. So her cups are her little pieces of the outside world. And she has a friend that she likes to show these cups to, but she never just takes a cup. She always takes some of her wonderful cooking. I say wonderful, she is poor. They never have fresh good ingredients, so she has to be creative. She is a very creative cook and her friend, Charlie, loves her cooking. Probably not because it's actually so delicious, but because she made it and because it represents the life that he doesn't get to be part of, the normal person life. Speaking of which, he and Tress have this little understanding where he says he's not the Duke's son, he's the groundskeeper, and she knows, and he knows that she knows, and they know the truth, but they continue because it kind of evens out their station. If she's just a normal person and he's the Duke's son, they can't really be that good of friends. If he's just the groundskeeper, that kind of puts them on an even playing field for having things in common and falling in love. Can I just say, how cute Charlie and Tress are. They are just adorable. So they're one of those cute relationships that start out as friends and then they just kind of slowly get to know each other and they grow comfortable with each other. And one day when it's basically too late is when they finally realize that they love each other. Charlie likes to talk. Tress likes to listen, but something special about Charlie is that he doesn't just like to talk, he will also be a good listener to Tress when she wants to open up and talk. And because she's one of those quiet, introspective people, which I can relate to, <laughs> she doesn't open up easily to just anybody. Charlie is special to her. He makes her feel safe and comfortable, and she knows she can open up to him and she feels safe being herself with him. Comfortable, like an old pair of gloves. And he never makes her feel like she's bothering or inconveniencing him. He is always happy to see her. And something that I noticed, um, every character in this book wants to refer to Tress's hair as something besides a normal word for hair color. They use foods honey, caramel, wheat, what have you, except Charlie. He still doesn't use a normal hair color word, but he says sunlight, which I think is way more romantic than some type of food. <laughs> there is this scene where Tress is sipping her lukewarm salty tea, watching the spore sea, and she's thinking how pretty the sea is, she can watch the horizon, she enjoys the view, and she thinks, I think I'll be fine here till the end of my days. And oh boy, that telling yourself, 
I'll be fine. I'll be okay. I think a lot of us have probably thought that before. And that's how we know that she's actually trying to convince herself that she'll be fine. And here's something else she thinks about herself. She thinks she is so normal, unremarkable, unextraordinary, maybe even boring, but really her extraordinary self just hasn't had a reason to come out yet. It hasn't had its chance to shine. And you know what does make it come out and shine? True love. She and Charlie fit each other like an old pair of gloves. They're not going to fit anyone else. Even though Charlie's father wants to make him leave and go get married for political reasons, and Tress is convinced by Charlie to speak up and tell the truth to him and tells him, I don't want you to leave. I don't want you to go marry somebody else. That was just what Charlie needed to hear. So he promises her, I won't marry anyone else. I will do what I am so good at and I will talk them and bore them to death. Not to death. He'll bore them so much they could never consider marrying him, which is fine. When he leaves, he takes the time to send her a cup and a letter, but eventually the cups stop coming and Charlie himself never comes back. His father does. His father comes back with this new heir, but no Charlie. His father left him behind in danger to the midnight sea. He should probably be presumed dead at sea, like Wesley. But unlike Buttercup, Tress goes after him. So Tress, as people might know her, probably doesn't seem like a very heroic person, but Heroes don't start out as a hero. They have to become heroic because something happened and Tress's true love got taken away from her. Ooh, spilled the tea. Shouldn't talk with my hands so much when I'm drinking tea. Vanilla almond, by the way, if you're wondering. But when Charlie doesn't come back and he's just presumed dead, it seems like nobody cares. Nobody cares about this wonderful, caring person. Tress feels like she's the only one who does. And if no one is going to do something for Charlie, she will. And this is the beginning of showing her true deep self that's never gotten a chance to come out. She does have some courage and determination to get her through things like this. And I love how supportive her parents are. Her mother helps her watch the docs and take notes and come up with a plan. And her father just kind of quietly goes and calls in some favors. And her mom doesn't really like the idea of her going off to be the hero. Normal mother reaction, gotta say. But the father believes in her and trusts her. He knows how smart she is. He knows how wonderful she is. And if she has taken the time to think this through, he can trust that she's making a good choice, or at least the only choice that she thinks she can make. Now, there are two parts to deciding to do something that you are afraid to do. The first is the internal battle of deciding. For someone like Tress, who's so introspective and things go on in her head more than what she talks about, that internal battle is probably harder than doing the thing that she took the time to decide to do. Especially for someone like her, because her plan involves sending herself she's gonna go. So I think actually doing the plan of going to rescue Charlie was easier for her than having to decide to do it. Because to leave, she has to face a bunch of fears. The fear of leaving home, asking for help, the spores themselves. But she makes it off the island. She pretends to be somebody she's not. She gets on the ship. She gets uh, captured and put below because it's actually not the type of ship she thought it was. <laughs> and there she meets a talking rat and the rat tells her that no man is worth dying for. And knowing about this rat, what we find out later, he's probably mainly referring to himself. I can't remember if he recognizes Tress when he says that or if he's just kind of having self-pity over what he is having to do, but he is not a happy rodent. 
especially when he sees that it's Tress and that she is trying to chase him. And then very quickly, she has to face head on one of the probably biggest inborn fears for people living on this world, and that is the spores themselves. She has lived on this salty island, so she's never had to be too close to actual spores, but when the ship she's on gets attacked, there's not much choice left to her except to walk out onto them and try to get to the other ship. And in this instance, she didn't really have to go out of her way to come up with a plan. There was only one choice in front of her. Stay here and sink and die or walk out onto the spores. And I think when there is no choice, <laughs> when you have to face your fear or else, it becomes a lot easier to face it. When there's no choice, you find out that you can actually do something that you didn't think you could do. And she gets a lot of practice facing her fears on this trip. Another thing she probably wouldn't have chosen to do, hey, let's go practice facing my fears, that's fun. Maybe it's not fun, but it is something you can practice. Now she finds herself on a new ship, a pirate ship. She doesn't immediately embrace the idea of becoming a pirate, but she does start getting to know the Dugs, or at least a few that we get the names of, kind of the main officers. And you know how she befriends them? Taking the time to get to know them and being kind to them. Kind of amazing how powerful and effective those two little things are. I know if someone takes the time to get to know me and is kind to me, it makes me more willing to be their friend. Getting onto this pirate ship kind of means that Tress has to rethink her plans. Her main goal is getting to the Midnight Sea and rescue Charlie, but she has taken the time to get to know these other people on this ship, and as she kind of accidentally, but kind of through some spying, finds out what Crow plans, she has a hard time leaving to go care for Charlie. Charlie seems so far away from her, she doesn't have a clear plan of action to save him at this point, but these people, this crew, are right in front of her. And when she has the choice to leave the ship or to stay, she chooses to stay. She is a kind-hearted person, and again, I think if she were to follow her heart, that would lead her towards Charlie, but sometimes following your heart makes you feel selfish, like you're just trying to get what you want, and she has a hard time with that. She is more the type of person to be giving and self-sacrificing and help this other crew. And so she's not lessening her want for Charlie, but she is kind of hoping that by helping the crew, she can get closer to her main goal and closer to Charlie. <laughs> and Charlie, or Puck as we know him at this point, also keeps trying to save Tress. He can't say who he is, he can't say that he's cursed or how to break it, but he keeps trying to dissuade Tress from going. He keeps trying to convince her to get off the boat, to leave, to go back. He loves her and he can't stand that she is going off into danger for him. He doesn't really think he's worth it, and as far as he knows, he's just gonna stay a rat for the rest of his life, and why would Tress want a rat? But luckily, by staying on the ship at that point when she could have left and almost left, she discovers that there is one person who knows where the sorceress is and who might be able to help her, Hoyd. So a good thing she stayed after all. Something else about these quiet people, if you don't have a quiet person in your life, is sometimes they can seem a little sneaky and observant. She notices the thing in the bottom of the barrel with the cannonballs. She sneakily changes out cannonballs. She does a little spying. She does some sports, experiments, and she kind of keeps all that to herself. She's not super open about it. Also, you can learn a lot by being observant. She was not the most qualified person to be the ship's sprouter, but she's not prone to panicking. She is used to using her brain and she is able to patch the ship when needed. She's also insisting that she's just as afraid of spores as everyone else, which to start, I believe she was. People who spend time sailing the spore seas get a healthy fear, healthy respect of the sea and of spores. But just like anything else you can practice, you can practice facing those fears, and Tress does. 
And by experimenting, she's learning more about them, which also helps lessen her fear. And she's thoughtful and she's not intimidated by new information. So whenever she goes and she talks to Ulam and he tells her weird new stuff, or Hoyd tells her stuff, whenever she learns something new, she just kind of takes it in, she internalizes it, she mulls it over. Something she's not afraid of is learning. Did Huck remind anyone else of Calcifer from Hell's Moving Castle? Let me know. But here's something I didn't think was really fair about their romance, is this whole time that Huck and Tress are on the ship together, Huck gets to spend time with Tress, getting to know her better, getting to observe her as she changes and grows and learns. She's becoming a different person and he is there for that. He gets to witness her change. He gets to support her, comfort her, gets to try to save her in his own way by trying to convince her to give up on him. And Tress doesn't get that. She doesn't know that Huck is Charlie. She knows that she enjoys his company, but she does not put together at all why that might be. Sometimes the quiet person seems mysterious to other people and the officers come to believe that Tress is a king's mask, a royal assassin. Maybe she's even taken these potions to make her look more youthful and she's more experienced than she seems. And then when they start kind of grilling her on how she knows stuff and she has to explain it, she realizes that it sounds suspicious. How did she spy on Captain Crow? Why can she do this interesting stuff with spores that no one else could do? Seems a little suspicious, doesn't it? And she can't deny it. No, I'm not a king's mask. Well, of course, that's what a king's mask would say. So we get to a point where Tress finally confronts Captain Crow. And later, after that confrontation, she is feeling overwhelmed. Everything she's been through and all the feelings that have been building up inside of her finally overflow and she cries. And Huck cannot stand to see her cry. This is his Tress that he loves and everything she's doing is for him. Oh, so cute. Charlie as a rat wants to jump to her defense and go bite the toes of whoever is making her cry. So she confesses that it's herself who has done all this. She's the one who put herself in this situation. So Huck comes and bites her toes. He tries it to be humorous and it works to a certain extent. And then he does what he always did at home and he talks to her. He tells her stories and this is comforting to Tress. This is the type of relationship that they had back at home. And one of the really sad things is that Charlie catches himself and says, oh, maybe I shouldn't talk so much. I'm always being told I talk too much. That was probably the Duke who was always telling him he talked too much. <laughs> Hate that guy. He probably is feeling insecure and maybe Tress only pretended to like his talking before because he was a handsome Duke's son and now he's just a rat. But Tress loved Charlie for who he was. And even in rat form, his talking to her is calming and comforting. And it wasn't until this point on my first read of the book that I started to maybe suspect Huck's true identity. <laughs> but then I thought that would be too weird that Charlie is this rat. And it was weird, but it was fine. And on my second read, I started to pick up on all those little things that he says and does. And I was like, so obvious. So she recovers from her sadness with a new determination to do something. And weirdly, discovers a new interest she never would have considered before. The mechanics of spore weaponry. She has the perfect mind for it. She's learning so much about herself on this trip. At this point, she already has the friendship of the main officers, but she starts to win the loyalty of the rest of the crew by cooking for them. She is very used to working with poor cheap materials and making something good out of it. So good, in fact, that Fort cried. And the amount that Soleil is trusting Tress to come through for them to help with Captain Crow and get them back safely is making Tress feel so bad and guilty. Up to this point, Charlie has been her main and only priority. But now there's a whole new group of people that she must consider in her plans. She does take some ownership of their danger. And if she hadn't won over the crew by now with the food, she really does by saving their entire ship, using her newfound knowledge 
of spores. They're in the Crimson Sea, this dangerous place. Everyone is scared, including her. And here she miraculously raises their ship above the Crimson Sea. And here Tress is brought super low. There's the attempted mutiny. She thought she could be a hero. She thought she could save Charlie, the crew, they could capture Captain Crow, and Crow just <clears throat> beats them easily. Why had she thought that she could do anything helpful? But she gets another chance. Hoyt encourages her and says, you have everything you need. So Crow takes her, the sacrifice, to the actual dragon, and Tress does not give up. She turns the tables and tries to convince Zysus to take Crow instead. And Zysus just loves this. He's a wily dragon. Having them pitted against each other is like probably some of the best entertainment he's had in a while. It must have been really weird for Tress to hear her enemy, Captain Crow, talking her up and talking about how amazing she is. <laughs> but Tress is able to impress and sway the dragon, earning herself a boon. For my boon, I request a duel. Wrong Cosmere book, sorry. And then we get the very Wizard of Oz moment. The heart, the brain, the courage. And she comes back with her gifts for her friends. Even more firmly cementing for them how amazing she is. She beat Crow, she convinced the dragon to believe her, and she brought them presents. They're pirates. They like loot, okay? And now Tress becomes captain, and she doesn't even need to ask them to go to the Midnight Sea with her. By this point, she has earned for herself something that Captain Crow never could, their love and their loyalty. I don't remember which one of them asks her, what's so special about this guy that we're trying to go save anyway? It's not so much that Charlie himself is special, but he's special to her. So the answer is true love. At this point now, they're nearing the end. They're through the Crimson, they're nearing the Midnight Sea, and Tress is tired. She is so tired. Where has her inspiration gone? She has no clever plan. She doesn't know what she's going to do. She forgot that she's not alone. She has friends at her back willing to help her and support her and think with her, which is super helpful when you are super tired. I really liked Hoyd's analogy of the carrying the bricks. Her emotional load is like a load of bricks that she's carrying, and at first when somebody takes a brick to help you, it's hard to feel the relief at first. At first you feel off balanced. Wait a minute, I have to trust someone else with my brick? She's also growing out of her cups. She still loves them because they still remind her of Charlie, but they represented places she's never been, and now she's been to places. I will take a moment to mention that I think it says a lot about Tress how impressed Hoyd is with her. Hoyd is experienced and well-traveled and he's met so many people and he keeps making little comments on her patience and ingenuity and how she thinks things through. I think that's a sign of high praise from Hoyd. I love that the crew is so supportive of Tress. Tress doesn't feel like Charlie should be so important to all of the crew. Why do they care so much about helping her? She's given them a mission. She's given them a chance of redemption. They kind of think they'll probably fail and die, but they were dead runners. They were going to have to be on the run. If they ever got caught, they would be punished. Now, if they make it back, they'll be heroes, and they kind of like that idea. So not only are the crew going because they love and admire Tress, but she's offering them something for themselves to kind of lift them up out of their pirate life. And they make it. They reach their goal. She wasn't sure whether to expect that this could actually happen, but it's kind of anticlimactic. They get there. She gets Charlie back. But it's not really what she expected. She feels some sadness, strangely. Charlie is exactly how she remembers, but she's not. She has changed a lot, and here's the Charlie that seems exactly the same. There is now a huge space between them that wasn't there before. The space between them that Charlie worked so hard on by pretending to be the gardener, and then when he smiles at her, it's been a long time since she's seen Charlie, at least in human form, but she knows his smile and she knows that that is not Charlie. So, mystery with Charlie solved. He's the rat. Go figure.
<laughs> but they're still trapped. What can they do about that? Just like Tress wanted to follow her heart to Charlie, the crew follows their hearts to go rescue Tress. And Tress finally asks for help. She asks outright, she says, please help me. She is asking people to risk their lives to come save her. She has come a long way, emotionally and literally. Now the happy ending is starting to happen. She has Charlie. Her friends get a chance to be their utmost selves. Fort gets to be the best trader and hunter in history, probably. Soleil shows what an incredible and determined helmswoman she is. And Anne gets to fulfill her passion with some help from Laggart, who himself is an excellent shot. And she gets help to uncover her own ability. Oh, and Charlie? does finally get the chance to save Tress in his shining armor or the cup that he rolls down the stairs in. <laughs> and I love how Tress just gives Hoyd orders like he's still her cabin boy. His curse is broken. He's revealed how powerful he is that Ulam hinted that he was. I'm not sure anyone really believed that. And Tress is just like, zap her or something. Well, he technically was still the cabin boy, so he obeyed the order. <laughs> and they send the sorceress off from the entire world. So the curses are broken. The crew gets to go home. They get their dreams fulfilled of being heroes. They get pardoned. And something else that I loved was that they showed the parents' reactions. Tress's family is so happy to see her and they pack up their bags and they're gonna go sailing the seas with her. They also get to escape the rock. We get to see that Charlie's mom was not impressed with Charlie's dad and she left Charlie's dad. She was not a fan of the son swap. This was all around a fantastic and fun story, great character work, but I am sure I still missed some stuff. What were some things that you loved about Tress or the Tress-Huck relationship or Hoyd or the other pirates. I don't know, tell me what you thought about this book. If you haven't already, subscribe to this channel for more character studies and bookish content like this, and I'll see you next time. Bye. Yo-ho, yo-ho, pirate's life for me.